Welcome to Cleethorpes. Today we've come to North East Lincolnshire to talk about Brexit opportunities in an area of the country that voted 70% to leave the European Union. I caught up with Brexit Opportunities Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg here at Papa's, the fish and chip shop that says it's the biggest in the world. Indeed, the fish and chip shop that was voted best in the UK in 2019. So, Jacob, you've just come from a civil service live event talking to 700 members of the civil service about one of your key roles, which is government efficiency. What do you have to say? Well, what I wanted to say was, first of all, to thank them, because lots of civil servants really do a fantastic job delivering the services that the British public need. And all they ever read about, particularly from me, is that I'm trying to reduce the numbers and I want to get them back into the office. Uh, and they need to be said thank you to because they do work very hard and without them public services wouldn't be um, operating. So that was the first point. And then to discuss how you reform the civil service to make it more efficient and so that it delivers the services that are needed with lower costs. And that's about providing the learning and development for civil servants so that they can improve the skills that they've got and as they do that get promoted and earn more money so there is a positive for them but at the same time reduce the total number. And you see this, a good example is DVLA. You know people have had difficulties getting driving licenses, so that seems to be a bit better now. But people who applied online actually were getting their driving licenses back pretty quickly. So if you were changing your address, you could do it online, and that was returned swiftly. If you were changing your name and your address, you had to do it by post, and that was taking months. And there is so much more you can do, particularly with the ability to check against other databases. Obviously, historically, if somebody was changing their name, you wanted to make sure you weren't creating a false identity. But there are so many cross-checks you can do with data that are available that it's the sort of thing that ought to be possible to do online. See, people don't normally associate you, Jacob rees with modernisation, with technology, <laughs> with using uh, the internet to make things more efficient. But this is a, a key part of your role now. It is, but it's also something I find very convenient in daily life, as we all do. Um, I was actually very keen at the beginning of the pandemic to have Parliament meeting remotely because I felt it was so important that Parliament continued. When faced with the alternative of no Parliament or a remote Parliament, I was arguing very strongly that Parliament had to continue to hold the government to account. What I then went on to say was that now this has passed, we can get back to normal. So it's using technology where it is the right thing to do. So do you see that in some circumstances, people working from home, flexible working, can boost productivity as well? It's not necessarily a binary situation. That, that, that's absolutely right. For some people in some jobs, it works very well. Uh, there are some um, highly technical jobs where you need to get on with the detail of your work and you don't want to be disturbed and you're not in regular meetings and you can get on with that very well from home. There are other jobs, and they may be developing policy, where you need to be discussing things with uh, your colleagues. Um, you need to issue a passport. You cannot issue a passport uh, from your back room. You really can't, because passports need to be held in a secure environment where you need to be in your office most days. And so it's getting that balance right that I think is so important. This is one of your big drives. You've been now publishing uh, statistics in terms of where civil service, um, where people who work for the civil service have been going to their core departments. Uh, what can you tell us about those numbers? Well, they're getting better um, until the railways went on strike. And this does show the selfishness of strike action because people being in the office does lead to services being delivered to the British public better. When the railways go on strike, then you find that fewer people are in and this affects the delivery of services. So I think it's important to underline the selfishness of unnecessary strike action. And so these strikes that took place last week... The figures dipped for last week, uh, having been on a pretty good rising trend uh, previously. Let's move on to the other half of your brief, of course. Not just government efficiency, but Brexit opportunities. And last week you announced a, a new dashboard uh, on the government website of retained EU law. Uh, a dashboard that anyone in the country can go and look at and see the thousands of pieces of EU legislation that are still on our statute books. What's the idea behind this dashboard? The, the idea behind it is partly that people can look at it and say, why have we got this ridiculous rule? And I'm encouraging people to do that. I was actually talking 
uh, to the fishing industry yesterday, the Scottish fishing industry, with David Dugid, who's a fellow member of Parliament, brought some constituents in. And in my briefing, it said there are 499 pieces of EU law that affect the fishing industry. And you know, we want to help the fishing industry. And therefore, I said to them, please tell me, which of these bits are most onerous? Which get in the way of you doing what you're doing efficiently? And then let's see if DEFRA can review them and ideally get rid of them. And that's the, the process, that we want to uh, look at every law in turn and say, is this law really necessary? Does it actually help the economy? Because we've got a cost of living problem. How do you deal with a cost of living problem? You tighten monetary policy, which the Bank of England's doing. You tighten fiscal policy, which is happening. But you also need supply-side reforms that make things cheaper and easier is for people. Is fiscal policy being tightened? The, the, the Prime yeah. Minister's boasting of £37 billion in extra spending. In, in real terms, yes, because the spending settlements were based on an inflation rate of about 2%. An inflation rate is now 9%, so there will be um, real reductions in the available public expenditure. They haven't been increased to meet the increase in the inflation rate. So there have been some ameliorations which have an effect, uh, but the total picture will be one of a tightening of the fiscal situation. See, this is interesting because it's not something that many of your colleagues in the Cabinet have articulated in terms of how to deal with the causes of inflation. We hear so much about how the government is dealing with the consequences of inflation, but it, when, when it comes to those causes... Uh, it, it, the government hasn't really been saying that it does want fiscal tightening. It is fundamental to understand the causes, because bear in mind inflation hits the least well-off in society the hardest. It hits the elderly on fixed incomes, and it hits the young who are just starting on their careers who don't have a rapidly growing income. And this is really important that we tackle the causes of inflation. And this is doing things that are difficult to do. I mean, increasing interest rates is hard for people. Um, tightening fiscal policy is hard for people. Therefore, we need to go further and faster with supply-side reforms because that's the one thing that ameliorates the otherwise tightening situation. But the, the um, Government Bank of England was setting out, I think, yesterday how difficult he sees the economy being and this is a global problem, that there is a global inflation. It comes from globally loose money policy going back to 2008. And it comes from um, interruptions in supply chains from COVID. These, I think, the primary drivers. And then, of course, Ukraine on top of that. And I think we need to set out how difficult it is and then what we're doing to solve it so that people understand the decisions that are going to be made and, of course, can help in terms of retained EU law by saying, actually, if you do this, that makes life easier, that makes life more prosperous. So a really interesting three-pronged approach there. Monetary tightening, fiscal tightening, and supply-side supply side reforms. reforms. And those supply-side reforms, which are more your purview than the other two areas, uh, have come under some criticism. Some people say that a lot of these regulations that you point to are trivial, that they don't really add up to all that much. What's your response to that criticism? a thousand trivial things make something quite substantial. But that's the point, that, that what the EU did was it strangled enterprise by thousands of pettifogging regulations, each one in and of itself minor, but cumulatively leading to a decline in economic growth and the prospects for economic growth. So yes, we've got to deal with all the individual ones, but sometimes something that you may think of as not being important, so take... Um, the approval of drugs regulation, leads to a phenomenal economic consequence. So billions of pounds. But take the regulations on HGV drivers. As I said, Grant Shapps got rid of quite a number of those. And therefore, we didn't have a shortage of drivers stopping Christmas taking place, which we were being threatened with. Mm. Now, you may say that whether or not uh, I can drive a car pulling a trailer because I took my test before 1997 and you can't because you took it after 1997 is fundamentally trivial and how can I disagree? Mm. But when you take um, a dozen and a half regulations away, you suddenly find you've got the ability to get lorry drivers who you need before Christmas. Bingo.
Mm. It's really interesting listening to that Brexit campaign. Of course, we're uh, sitting here in North East Lincolnshire, an area that voted 70% to leave the EU. And we heard so often during that campaign, whether it was the EU controlling the power of our vacuum cleaners or something you've been talking about more recently, the fact that you can't have uh, sparkling wine in anything other than a glass bottle. I mean, these things are now finally going to be dealt with. Yes, that's right. We have the ability to do it. And you have to ask the fundamental question, not just should we lessen this EU regulation, but do we need a regulation at all? Can't we just allow consumers to decide for themselves what type of vacuum cleaner they want to buy, what type of container they want their sparkling wine, let's call it champagne and wind up the French, um, uh, what type of uh, container they want their English champagne in? Mm. It's interesting, though, listening to you talking about this big deregulatory agenda. Uh, and it's clear that this is something that you passionately believe in. It's something that, that you think is a big benefit of Brexit. Do you think the rest of the government agrees with you? Because if we look at the direction of government over the last, not even couple of years with the pandemic, but even before then, we have been seeing a greater role from the state, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister talking about new roles for the state, and in many areas talking about enhancing regulation rather than reducing it. Well, I don't think the Prime Minister would have appointed me to this role if he weren't quite committed to deregulation and to getting the most of Brexit opportunities. But he could have appointed anybody. Um, he could have appointed some fanatical regulator had he wanted to, but he didn't. And I have had, in the job I've been doing since February, his complete support in what I'm trying to do. And I think that is where most members of the government stand. So what is success for you then, looking at how Brexit might turn this country into not quite a Singapore on Thames, but something closer to a model that looks more like that than the European well, model of a more de society? I think we're looking at Singapore on the Humber at the moment, <laughs> rather than on Thames, considering where we are. Uh, I, I, I think we should be a flexible, open economy. We should, one of the things I'm doing with single trade window, minimise barriers uh, to trade so that goods can come in and out of this country easily, helping the ports like Grimsby and Immingham uh, that I'm visiting today to ensure that the country is more prosperous. Any country in history that's ever adopted free trade, even when it's done it unilaterally, has prospered having done so. And that is what we should do. Free trade is one of those extraordinary things that it benefits the giver more than the receiver, or at least as much as the receiver. And that is really important. Yes, it's really interesting listening to trade discussions and discussion around trade discussions. Uh, importing cheaper things is seen as a concession, whereas uh, to, to most consumers that would be seen as a benefit. But um, you're, you're absolutely spot on. And um, I was speaking to um, a lady from The Sun earlier about Tesco's decision uh, not to stock Heinz baked beans. And this is fantastic, because Tesco is standing up for its customers. Mm. And there's an awful lot of government that stands up for the producer interest, what the EU fundamentally did. Mm. And so you, GB News, The Sun, Tesco's, stand up for the customer. That's what politicians should do too. It's interesting. This will be a big, big battle because, of course, the vested interests will be opposing all of these deregulatory attempts because the way that the system is currently constructed, constructed favours those incumbents. Oh, yes. I, 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 mean, I, I don't cover this because of uh, potential for conflict of interest. But if you take MIFID II, and I speak as um, uh, somebody who founded an investment management company, once you've, got financial financial regulation. Regulation, once you've gone through the pain and the cost of setting up MIFID II, you think, whoopee, no new competitors can come in. Mm. So when the government says, oh, we might do something about that, you say, oh, no, 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 we've spent the money. Please don't do that. Let's keep the nasty competitors out. Mm. But if you're consumer-focused, you want to say, let's make this more competitive. Well, I suppose some of those uh, problems in terms of doing consumer-focused things is that consumer benefits are more dispersed, whereas producer benefits are more concentrated, and you get that sort of organisation. But finally in this conversation, I do want to talk about the free port status mm -hmm. coming to this area, coming to the Humber. Uh, what does a free port really mean? And, and what is Brexit going to deliver in terms of free port status for this area? Well, Brexit allows us to do it in a way that we couldn't possibly do it whilst in the European Union, because the EU says it's state aid and so on and so forth. You can do all sorts of things with a free port. It depends how far you want to go, but you can give tax advantages. You can have um, customs-free areas for, for the free ports. Um, you can uh, have... Um, as they had uh, in Docklands when that was developed, you can have specific planning 
authorities say that you don't have to go through the cumbersome planning regulations. There are all sorts of things you can do with three ports. But it is a fundamental freedom being outside the European Union. And what does it do? It allows enterprise to flourish. I mean, there is an argument you should make the whole of the UK a free port. But perhaps we'll have to be a little patient for that. So the, the free port in this area is going to be really quite expansive. There are going to be tax incentives. There are going to be uh, freer ways to do customs. But particularly on building regulations, are we looking at genuinely an area now where we could be able to build, build, build? Well, um, it will depend on exactly how the free port is designed and it isn't finalised, but it is one of the things that you can do. Uh, and ports, I was speaking to the Immingham port earlier, they have some proposals that they think under current regulations would take them six years to do. Well, we need it tomorrow, not in six years. They're so sclerotic for the, for the economy. So the job must be to make free ports as effective as possible to get things done. Well, Jacob Bruce Mogg, it's been an absolutely fascinating and wide-ranging conversation. Thank you so much for making Always the time. Thank you very much.